Okay, well, good, uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about the ECG. I think the first thing that I'm going to say is that this is not just going to be a pure ECG talk. Uh, one of my other uh, main interests is actually cardiac MRI, so you might find a bit of that uh, dropping into this talk. The reason I think I've done that is what I want to demonstrate to you, that really the ECG, great though it is, it's actually the start of a process and the start of a pathway. So, and what I've done is we're going to look at some ECGs, some common ECGs, and then perhaps bring those together with some common conditions and see how we use the ECG to take things forward. Well, where did the ECG come from? Well, the first description of an electrocardiogram, actually, you've got to go right back to... Uh, 1887, uh, where a chap called Waller produces the first electrocardiogram, and that was just a single line tracing. The first description of an abnormal ECG comes two years later, with McWilliam describing ventricular fibrillation. The way in which we describe the nomenclature of ECGs that we use in everyday standard practice is defined a few years later by Eindhoven, who defines P, Q, R, S, and T waves, which I'll show you in a second, and we'll remind ourselves of that. AF, another very common arrhythmia or abnormality on the ECG that we see is described a few years later. And the standard configuration of an ECG that we're all used to today actually occurred just before the Second World War with the standardization of the anterior chest leads. These are V1 to V6. Well, what are all the various points. Let's just remind ourselves from our medical school days. So here is a cartoon of, an EC, of a, a whole cardiac cycle. We've got here P, QRS deflection, and T wave. So the P wave represents atrial depolarization. The J point, which is at the start of the QRS complex, that is used to determine ST changes, particularly on things like an exercise tolerance test, which, if you, as you've heard, are probably moving away from relying on that test as much as perhaps we used to. The QRS complex rec represents ventricular depolarization, and the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. The, then we can measure various time intervals. So the PR interval tells us something about AV nodal function. The ST segment tells us about depolarization of the ventricles. The QT interval, which has to be corrected for heart rate, um, that, if it's prolonged, can be related to sudden death. And the RR interval, obviously, the time between each cardiac cycle, that just gives us the heart rate. So this is a normal 12-lead ECG. It's a fairly standard configuration. So you've got the anterior chest wall leads here, the limb leads here. And I think we're all fairly used to seeing completely normal 12-lead ECGs. Uh, this is not a normal ECG. Um, I think you can see fairly clearly there is just totally disordered, random electrical activity. Uh, and that's an ECG of VF. It's unusual in that it's a 12-lead ECG. We don't normally do 12-lead ECGs in somebody in ventricular fibrillation because they're usually pretty damn sick. So... Just to show you something similar to ventricular fibrillation, this is ventricular tachycardia, where again, across all the leads, what you can see is a broad QRS complex, regular and fast, about heart rate of about 200, 220. Now, this can either be pulseless, i.e. no cardiac output, or you can have a cardiac output, in which case, again, the patient may well have palpitations. They're likely to be hemodynamically unstable. They're going to be pretty unwell. This is another 12-lead ECG of ventricular tachycardia. Looks pretty disorganized, probably about to degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. Interesting, just I'll mention on this, actually, this patient actually walked in with this. So uh, quite impressive. We didn't leave them like that for too long. Um, something that some of you may have heard of, torsades. So this is a bizarre, slightly bizarre, unusual form of ventricular arrhythmia. And... As you can, what you can see here, it's perhaps not the best example. It's quite hard to find, but you can see that the axis, okay, the, the axis, the overall direction of depolarization of the ventricle is actually swinging around, and that's what happens. This classically is said to be best treated with magnesium, but I think the reality is, again, somebody who has this is going to be extremely well. We're going to try and shot them out of it fairly quickly. Moving on to something... We've been talking about chest pain earlier on. And here I think you can see that the ST segments in the anterior chest leads 
are quite markedly elevated. There's probably four to five millimeters of anterior ST elevation with some what we call reciprocal changes in the inferior lead, some depression of the ST segment. So this would be a very classic ECG of a large anterior ST elevation myocardial infarction. It doesn't always look quite that apparent on the ECG, and sometimes it can be a little bit more tricky, but what you can see on this ECG is perhaps not some, there is perhaps a little bit of ST elevation here in V4, but not truly meeting criteria. The ST segments inferiorly perhaps look slightly depressed, but you can see Q waves on the anterior leads. If we move on to what would happen next, so diagnostic coronary angiography, just going to show you a still image here. This is the left main stem into the left anterior descending artery, which is where anterior ST changes are usually relate to. And you can see here that there is an inclusion of the proximal left anterior descending artery. So is this a myocardial infarction? Well, looking at the ECG, we may well think so, because here, sorry, here we can see some ST elevation in the lateral leads. That doesn't project particularly well, but V5 and V6, again, some ST elevation. So that was an initial ECG that's done. This is a further ECG that's done. Again, the ST elevation persists. The layout's perhaps slightly different. Also here, you can see some right bundle branch block. The next day, this has resolved. So what was the diagnosis? Did we just sit there and let somebody have a myocardial lymph arc? Well, we probably didn't. So I'm going to bring you way up to date now. So what we actually did is an MRI scan. Now, we're going to have a crash course in MRI in about 30 seconds. These are moving images, uh, left and right ventricle to atria. This image is a cut through here, so they're perpendicular to each other. And what you can see here is the bottom or the base of the left ventricle is contracting normally and that it's thickening normally. And here you can see nothing very much is going on at all. One month later, when we scanned this patient, you can see that everything's gone back to normal. Now, this is a very rare heart, very rare condition, but it does occur, and it's related to some form of stress, and it's called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Um, and that Takotsubo is Japanese for lobster pot, and really, it's because of this very bizarre temporary appearance that you see here. But the point I want to make is that, okay, the majority of times ST elevation does mean acute myocardial infarction, but not always so. And that's really where the, more, the newer imaging techniques perhaps come into their own in trying to sort things out. Okay, well, what's going on in this ECG? In the lateral leads, one and AVL, some ST elevation, some depression here. In the ST depression in the inferior leads, perhaps quite tall QRS complexes in a young person, I think. This has now become more marked on a subsequent ECG. Well, what's going on here? Okay, so we can see that this part, again on an MRI image, the anterior wall is not contracting normally. The inferior wall, the underside of the left ventricle is. And here what we've done is, we've, we'll, we'll hear about this in the next talk, but we can directly visualize scar in the myocardium. And this MRI image shows a lump of scar in the top of the left ventricle in the anterior wall. And this would be consistent with something called myocarditis, which you'll hear about later. This is an ECG showing somebody in atrial fibrillation. Baseline perhaps a bit variable. This person actually came into the department feeling fit and well. Um, they actually underwent some, during some diagnostic testing, as you can see, they became very unwell. So they've got ventricular tachycardia here, degenerating into ventricular fibrillation for which they were cardioverted. And then here you can see anterior S gross, anterior ST elevation. So they're having an anterior myocardial infarct and just to show you, this is, no, this is where the left anterior descending artery is. Remember, anterior ST elevation relates to left anterior descending artery. So no left anterior descending. And after a successful angioplasty and stent insertion, we have the left anterior descending appears. Again, this is just to say that you don't always have to have ST elevation to have a myocardial infarction. And I, don't, I do apologize that it's a bit grainy, but I would bring your eyes to this lead here, lead V3, and what you can see here is some T-wave inversion, and that with a raised troponin and a presentation of chest pain, again, that could indicate uh, myocardial infarction, non-ST myocardial infarction, and this is actually an ECG of somebody who's had what we used to call LAD syndrome, and it's deep T-wave inversion, and it is related again 
to a blockage of the left anterior descending. Okay, so it's fairly short and sweet, but I hope that I've shown you some common conditions and really tried to explain to you that the ECG is really the start of the process these days rather than the, the end. Thank you very much.